هنا الكويت أيها المواطنون الكويتيون الأحرار أيها العرب في كل مكان إن غزو الكويت باسم العروبة هو أحد أعاجيب الدنيا ولكن متى عرف الطغيان الحياة The latest flight bringing British people home from Iraqi occupied Kuwait is due to arrive at Gatwick tomorrow. It's thought only a few women and children will be on board. Most of the hostages still trapped in Iraq are men who haven't been allowed to leave. Their only links with home are letters and photographs smuggled in diplomatic mailbags. This is my room where I sleep, but this is the remains of my wife after cremation. So she's by my bed every night. And she'll stay there until I die. My name is Marshall Byers. On this date in 1990, I was a hostage in Iraq. I left here when I was 16. Then I went and moved to Airdrie, near Glasgow. I got married there to my wife, Rena. When I was 18, she was 16. When I moved to Germany, after Germany, then I moved to Cyprus, where I was offered a job in the oil business, and that is how I got to Kuwait. At first, arriving in Kuwait, it was like walking into a hairdryer when you got off the aircraft. The heat was unbelievable. I had never seen such heat in my life before. My job was loading ships, ships loaded crude oil. I was there for 10 years and in 1990 I got a call from my daughter saying, Dad, get out of there. The Iraqis are on the border. I said, Dad, ah, don't worry, nothing will happen. I like to think it didn't affect me, but I think it did in other ways that probably have, you know, have come out in other situations, you know what I mean? Because I had to become independent because my mum and dad weren't kind of, a long time weren't there for me. But that's not their fault. It was done by others, so I don't think this is, you know, yeah. I, I'm also angry about what's happened. My wife was with me. I said, well, let's get out of here. And a lot of my friends did get out of there, but they didn't take me because of my wife. They were scared in case there was, they, they run into opposition, you know. Is it true that some Britons decided not to go with you? And what are your feelings about those who are still there? Well, it's every man, it's every man who can make their own mind up, you know, if they don't want to go, they, they don't go. But uh, us three decided we want to go and it's about time we made a move. She didn't want to go. She wasn't going to go. She, wasn't, she wanted to stay with me. But I forced her to go. I said, you get out of here. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you can get killed, she said, I don't care. I said, get out of here. They did go, and that's when the two Syrian guys took him in the car, went through the checkpoints and got them. She came home and she was broken. There's no denying it, she was broken. Because she was worried sick, going to hiding and my dad having to hide and do what he could to protect her. Um, it was diff difficult to get her to talk. You know, all she wanted to do was drink, to, to drown, you know, to put away the, the problems that we were having. After that, we just went and hiding. In the daytime, we hid in the air conditioning unit for 12, 15 hours and came down at night.
we could hear the, the World Service radio, I showed you the radio, but they couldn't give you any information. It was just a message your family would give you. Two or three sentences. Are you okay? And things like this, you know. 380 Western women and children who hope to fly home from Kuwait today on an American chartered plane are still in Iraq. We, we somehow had to try and continue normal day to day, but nothing was ever normal. <laughs> look, 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 up there, there's fire. Look up there. Look up there, there's fire. And the British Embassy gave us a number of the, the Kuwaiti resistance who you could call and ask for, you know, if you wanted anything, if you needed anything. Like a bag of rice, a 50 kilo bag of rice, which was a great thing to have, you know, a huge bag of rice that, and plus the tins. And they gave these guys the food. And that's when I wrote these letters. I think it was. New Zealand guys are who got the letters out for me. I forgot about these letters. It was my son that found them in the house. When I was cleared out, you know, after my wife died. Hi darling Rena, I am writing this in the hope that somehow it may get through to you. Somehow, but very difficult. Our flat is stinking, plants thrown everywhere and flies by the million. Day after day, people were trying the door to our flat and Martin and I were pushing against the other side of the door to keep them out. They took my diamond ring, my wedding ring, my St. Christopher and my watch and wallet with all my photos. The three soldiers were really trying to get in and we had to push like hell to keep the door shut. I'm fed up beating lentils and pasta. Chin up, darling. Can't wait to see you and give my love to everyone, especially Amy Jane. All oh, my love forever, Marshall. That's it. Yeah. Mar we knew we had we'd known previously that Marshall had obviously tried to escape the the chance of being captured for so long, for, for four months indeed, so until such time as as he was eventually captured, and then at least 12 days later. After five, mon five months in hiding, I was caught on St Andrew's Day, the 30th of November, and they said to me, are you English? I says, no. Scotland. Scotland? Where's Scotland? I says, well, I'm from Scotland. I'm not from England, I says, I'm from Scotland. And he went on his radio to whoever, and he went, ah, Britanni, same, same, so I got crammed just the same. They see themselves as the prisoners of a war that hasn't happened yet. Free to live and work, but not free to leave. These are just some of the 480 Britons now existing in Iraq. And this is the highlight of their week. A rare delivery of post from home. Ironically brought in by European embassies because the British Foreign Office wouldn't allow them to use the diplomatic bag. When they caught us, they took us to Baghdad. They took us on an aircraft, made us stand by the runway. They'd obviously at that time taken all the hostages from Iraq, the human shields who were caught very early in the conflict. And uh, we all went and flew back to London. And uh, that's when they were caught. Well, not caught, but hit by uh, British or American forces. I don't know what ones hit them. But you can see the footage on television. Building or No, I mean, I mean, kill me. Airport, airport. No. They are so sad about it. The terror has gone, it's good to Kuwait is liberated. When I arrived there, I got off the aircraft and my wife, Rina, was allowed to come on the tarmac and meet me on the actual tarmac. And then when I went inside the 
care for. There's my mother and family. And uh, <laughs> then, of course, all the newspapers got involved. I had to sit down and just cancel. Cancel. What does this mean? Cancel. She couldn't hardly walk, so she had to be basically washed and cleaned in bed every day. And that's when the, the carers came in, morning, afternoon, night. My granddaughter, Amy Jane, came up to the pub and said, Right, Dad, Granny's, I'm dying. The clock is the time she died, 20 past three in the morning. The worst five months of my life, <laughs> you can, you'll never, you'll never go over that feeling, watching your wife die. What was going on inside your head? Well, where do I go from here? <laughs> sort of thing. I didn't know what was going to happen because prior to coming here he wasn't in a good place because obviously we've been through a lot of heartache as a family recently. Lost my mum and then my brother. Um, I actually thought about cancelling the whole trip when I seen that it, he needed it, he did need to come. Because it's something he said on many occasions, the box is open now, I need to go and do this. I was like, yeah, we do, we do. Well, this is where we used to come on a Friday. My wife, Rena, and myself come shopping to the old market, and she loved to shop all day. There's still stuff in the house yet, which he bought here. Chips and wine. Scot Scotland. Scotland. Oh, yeah. I get some. He is American. He is American. Marshall, you, you look like you're enjoying yourself a little bit. I do enjoy, I do enjoy it. You can't be a curmudgeon right now. This, this brings memories back, this does, you know, just going around this market. Yeah. Everything's so fresh here. Dates, look at all the different kind of dates we got. I love dates. To me, it's, it's quite difficult. <laughs> because I can bring back when we were together and it just, it sort of brings her to life again, if you know what I mean. I've, I've been up there once, well, there it's lit up again. It was the wife who wanted to go, Rena. She wanted to go up there, you know. And she's got, in her cabinet back home, she's got a copy of that. It's the last thing I thought of, you know, being back here. I never thought I'd ever be back in this country. The British Embassy were confined, as, as was the American Embassy, they were, enclosed in their embassies. They couldn't get out, but the Iraqi troops wouldn't go into the embassies because it's, what do you call it? Foreign soil, basically, isn't it, an embassy? Uh, we urge the uh, Iraqi government to allow the power to be turned on and the water to be turned on at the uh, embassy uh, compound in Kuwait. Uh, they do need water. They do need power. They do need telephone access to Washington. If they cannot get that, their food will spoil within the next two days. So how long were you in Kuwait altogether? Before Ten you, years. Ten years before all that happened? Yeah, 1980 I came to Kuwait. Right. And 1990, right. I came in. Was it 1991, something like yeah. that? We got the apartment there. The time we stayed in the vent, I was in the third floor and Martin in the first floor. <laughs> it drives you nuts. You know, you're sitting there. You had one big tin for the toilet. <laughs> you have to do. And uh, we'd come down at night and cook a meal. I can't remember. I wonder, what's the other side of that? 
هذا من الفريج هذا من الفريج هذا من الفريج كانت في سنة No, I know. I know when you come along from Minotank, along that street. It was mostly sand. It wasn't any of this roads like this, you know. Maybe, maybe it's maybe it's along the next bit, the next bit. If I was there, I would stay in that one. Oh. <laughs> Where is it? How are you? Fine. Ah, this. They've opened it from this end, but I'd need, a, I'd need a ladder to get up and look in there. I'd stand on a stool with a rope attached, climb on the stool, crawl in there, then pull the stool into the tunnel. Sure. Oh, this brings back memories. Oh my God. One meal a day. We ate one meal a day at night time when we came out of the air condition. But when they started raiding the air conditioning, for some reason somebody found out. Then we had to move to the roof. How it's changed up the place. I came across the story through Facebook, but actually I am the last piece of this puzzle. The first piece of this puzzle was the article in the Kuwait Times. And then I read it and I thought, wow, this is really, I was really intrigued at the story. So I asked my manager, Mr. Kumar, if he would pass this information on to Mr. Ghazi. Ms. Michelle, our KG vice principal, I'm sorry, our elementary vice principal passed on a contact from her social uh, media asking for uh, a trace to find out one Mr. Samuel Dabbus to contact his old friend, Mr. Marshall. And for Mr. Marshall to be able to find Mr. Sammy and close that circle. For me, that was a beautiful part of that story. <laughs> That's so. <laughs> how are you? Hey. Great to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah, how are you? Fine, thank hey, you. Hey, you're looking well. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. You're getting a bit older. <laughs> I'm 67. That's me after. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you a long time no see? 25 years. All right, how's Scotland? Good. I never thought I'd be back here, I tell you, I never. <laughs> My God, shall we go to Baghdad? Oh, really? Is you think that as well, everything? Is everything gone. is gone. My beach house. Really? Yes. My house, everything. Cars. Cars, yes. This part in the seafront, unbelievable. Yeah, that was never there before, like, you know. <laughs> 25 years ago. Yeah, gee, it was. I'm retired now, I finished. Uh, somebody's contact to my cousins, the yeah. uh, Al Dubus, okay. and uh, you ask about me, right. and they let me know, and I was surprised. <laughs> and they say one guy from UK, but I never thought it's you. Scotland, you didn't. Yes. If they Scotland, maybe they would have. Yes, till they told me he's Marshall. And I was really surprised. I said, you know Marshall? I said, yes, I, <laughs> I know Marshall very so well. No English, no Scotlandy. Scotlandy? My English? No, 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 no English. <laughs> really, I was upset because there is no contact with you. Oh, okay. And I don't know your phone in Scotland. Okay. And I missed all this. That's and I right, don't know yeah. about your wife, really. Uh, my son, my I know son I will call you and say sorry. Yeah. Yes, this is the life. I will leave you my number. Yes, please. <laughs> your friend forever. <laughs> After that, we just moved the roof and we lay under the water tanks on the roof. I lay under one and we took a mattress up 
threw them up the roof, put it under there, and for the rest of the time, which you'd I'd say two and a half months maybe. See the two water tanks up there? That was Martin under that one, and I slept under that one. If you give me your camera, I'll take a photograph of the roof. Well, David's going to. I don't know how to work your camera. This was all tiled, like this. It was perfect. It was a brand new building, you know. There was a swimming pool on the roof, which we emptied because it was going to get stagnant. We just opened the valves and it went over the, the desert, like, you know. And uh, nobody seemed to notice her. It was a great swimming pool every Friday. Mum used to come up here at night. Swimming. <laughs> it's coming back to me now, you know, <laughs> how you felt then. In, you what, know? in what way? The time that you spent on that roof, the time you spent on that roof, just wasted time of your life. Thanks for taking me back here. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely brilliant. It's scary, actually. And to keep on going, it's quite difficult. You know, what am I going to do tomorrow? Well, <laughs> and that little job I've got is a great break for me to go out the house, you know, and mix with people. And I have good days and bad days up to this day. You know, some days I feel, okay, next day, ooh. You're down, you know. You just sit and look at the photograph. Just sitting there. What do you do? What do I do that? I keep looking. When I'm sitting watching the TV in that seat, I sit in. I keep thinking that bed's still there. I've got the grandchildren, but I sit every day now. And every day's a, a long day. Because I look after them every night when they come home from school, three o'clock, till Debbie gets home, five o'clock. I make them something to eat or whatever, you know. It, it, it occupies me for a couple of hours. I don't mind looking after them at all. I don't have to look after them. I like them being there. What goes through your mind? I don't know whether it touched my mind or not. I don't know whether it affected me. But it made you have a complete new attitude to life, that life is worth living, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you come that close, to where the guys could have shot that guy could have shot me in that flat and nobody would have known. I just wished she could see the film that you're gonna make. That's all I can. Like, you know.